progress. And uh, you can also watch back uh, previous sessions that we've done. We've had some fantastic, fantastic speakers with some great career stories as well about a whole range of things as well. Um, talking about how to, uh, what's the best career path for you and how to get into a huge array of careers from wildlife cinematography uh, through to uh, ACA accounting, chartered accounting. So there's a huge array of stuff that we've got on the website. So make sure you go and check it out as well. Um, and we're also going to be raising uh, money for the uh, Children's Trust, but I'll talk to you later on at the end of today's session about how you can go about doing that. So like I said, make sure you follow us on social media. And uh, I think I'm just going to wait for the all clear, but we'll get started in just a second. So uh, if you've got any questions, make sure you send them through as we're going through. They'll come through to me and uh, we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can um, during uh, the Q&A at the end of today's session. If we unfortunately don't manage to get round to uh, answering your question, uh, we'll try and send as many as we can over to Ben. And uh, if he's going to be kind enough to uh, answer a few of them and put them on the replay website um, where you'll be able to watch this uh, exact video again uh, on replay. All right, let's get started with today's session. So welcome back to Learn Lounge, everyone. Uh, it's been a fan, uh, fascinating week here at Learn Lounge with some amazing speakers and employers joining us to deliver some absolutely fantastic talks. Now, for those of you just joining in, uh, Learn Lounge is part of our mission to ensure uh, you get inspiring career stories direct from influential people right across a range of different industries, from technology to the creative arts and beyond. We're SpringPod and we are dedicated to helping young people make more informed choices when it comes to their future careers. So far, we've had uh, ex-professional footballer Paul Robinson, uh, motivational speaker uh, Hayley Molenda, influencer, talent manager Verity Park and many, many others. Uh, so if you've missed any of those, don't worry. Uh, you can catch all the replays on demand via the Learn Lounge website, all for free. Uh, my name's Joe, and I'll be hosting today's session of Learn Lounge. Just a few pointers before we start. Uh, today's session should last about 40 minutes. Um, yeah, today's session should last about 40 minutes. Please do ask questions uh, using the uh, Q&A function on the website as well. And remember to tag us on social media as well. Uh, we're also in partnership with the Children's Trust and uh, I'll give you the donation link uh, at the end of today's session. So today we've got Ben Duffy, an experienced uh, commercial sports photographer who has quite an adventurous uh, career journey. Uh, his work has been featured in various national newspapers, including uh, The Times, The Guardian and The Independent. And his work has taken him to all corners of the globe, from lion tours to track days in the Mojave Desert. He's got an incredible client list, including EA Sports, Puma, Nike, Adidas, the Premier League, and so many others. Uh, it's an absolute honor to have him here with us today. I'm very, very excited. Uh, ben, welcome to Learn Lounge. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Um, so if you just want to, I'll, I'll let you. Take over. Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, if I'll let you take over, and if you just want to let us know the beginnings of where it all started for you. Brilliant. Right. So uh, I got contacted a couple of weeks ago to do this, uh, and I've been kind of musing over, you know, what 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 it is we need to talk about, what your young uh, aspirational uh, clients are, uh, you know wanting looking to get from me um it's and it's been a really it's been quite interesting because i've just been looking at my own career and and where i've got to and what what i've done and what i'm doing now which is in my industry uh, a kind of ever moving feast so i'm i'm freelance and you know lots of people go out they get jobs uh you get a certain amount of security uh, in having employment and I don't have that. I get to kind of make my my own <laughs> decisions, my own path, which on the one hand is brilliant because I can uh, spend the day uh, playing golf or Call of Duty or whatever I want, <laughs> if I want to. But at the same time, if nobody sends me or sends me anywhere to do any work or gives me any jobs, then I'm in trouble. So there's a lot of pressure as well as a lot of reward. It's, it's one of those industries. Um, now, if you were tuning in to watch what I was to, uh, what I'd got to say today with the view of being a photographer, this might be uh, very relevant 
But I also think what I've got to say is relevant if you're looking to work in any freelance capacity or, or work in, in general, especially in the creative industries, because that's what I know most about. Um, but is this about just being a photographer? I don't think it is. I'm not entirely sure that that exists anymore. Being a photographer per se exists as a, let's call it a kind of career aim or, or something that you aspire to being. I think you need to aspire to being more than that these days, but I'll get into that. Um, the old days, uh, when when I first started, it, it was it was very very different. Um, a photographer had kind of two paths. You would either go into uh, uh, you'd do a course, you'd do a course in photojournalism, you would be a newspaper editorial photographer, or you from school you would leave, you'd become an assistant. So you'd assist these incredible photographers. In those days, the the field was was very very small. These very technically and uh, artistically brilliant people that ruled an industry. You would go and assist one of those guys. You travel the world. You'd learn how to do that industry by watching those people, and then you'd move on. You'd start. You'd get your own clients. You'd do this. You'd you'd grow. So the press photographers do that. Commercial photographers would do that. Now, I've interest I, as a kind of exercise. I just went back and looked at the last five jobs that I've done. So. The last five jobs I've done, and I'm just going to say this now. Uh, I love the sound of my own voice. I've got a massive ego. So I think that kind of is part and parcel of being a photographer. Uh, you need it, especially with dealing with some of the people I have to photograph. So this isn't showing off. This is just what my last five jobs were. But there is a point. The last job I did was covering Manchester United against Bruges. Uh, I was employed by Manchester United to go in and essentially not... Uh, I'm a sports photographer initially when I first started out, but this was to go in and l just take that little look around the back of things, like just take a step back from the normal view, uh, focus on the things that people aren't normally focused on with their big long lenses at football matches. Just look at the reactions of the manager, the players that are warming up on the sideline. What happens after a goal scored is, you know, who, who's celebrating? Where's the, uh, where's the kind of, uh the the interesting angle the job before that was an adidas olympic shoot so i was i was in a studio i had a crew of five we were photographing all the adidas athletes that are appearing in the olympic games next year now um the job before that was the the uh the kit for manchester united i was photographing next season's kit um and there was a crew of 60. There was a catering truck. There was limousines everywhere, ferrying these footballers in and out. The job before that was some headshots of my friend Ange, a, a business in, in Leeds. So my, the, the point I'm trying to make, probably very badly, is that this, this role, this, this industry that I'm in, is, has no fixed, <laughs> no fixed uh, lane I do anything for everybody at any time. I will have said to numerous people, if you paid me enough, I would paint your garden fence. That's not to um, say that I wouldn't do that anyway, but basically uh, in the job that I'm in, you're very lucky if you just do consistently the kind of jobs that you want to do. There is always a bit of give and take. Anyway, so, Let's, I just want to go back to, to kind of where this all started for my journey. So I, I tried to get the earliest picture that I could find of, of when I started taking things seriously. I went to a very academic school. Um, I was not very academic. I kind of found my niche in art. I discovered that I could be quite expressive and actually did really well. I thought, right, that, that's, my, that's my aim. So I did a, an art foundation course. A long story short, I ended up at Plymouth College of Art Design. I was going to be an underwater photographer. I was going to travel the world. I was going to photograph uh, whale sharks uh, and, um, you know, incredible beaches and, you know, sea an enemy and whatever, wherever. Uh, I soon discovered that if I were to be an underwater photographer, I'd spend most of my time at the bottom of the North Sea photographing the bottom of oil rigs. And the likelihood of me perishing 
doing that job was quite high. And I was like, I'm not really sure that's that's a path for me. So I discovered uh, uh, that Plymouth Football Club were were in need of a photographer to go and help them out. So I used to go a weekend and photograph Plymouth Argyle Football Club. Um, I used to get abused by the fans uh, for looking like a student. Um, but week in, week out, I go and I kind of developed this this brilliant portfolio of images that uh, that, were, that were invaluable. These days you can't do that. Uh, you can't get into shoot football at football clubs because the licensing is so tough. So I was I was ahead of the curve. I was very lucky, um, uh, and I kind of got in early. I won a competition. I won the Daily Telegraph Young Sports Photographer of the Year, which I think about four people entered, and it allowed me to go to the World University Games in Sicily, where I. Uh, spent two weeks photographing. It was basically like a mini Olympics. It was incredible. On the back of that, I got a job in Leeds. So I worked for a small editorial agency. That means that we were a band of three. Newspapers would phone us up and say, we need you to go and cover this football match. We need you to go and take a picture of this guy, that's uh, this portrait of this guy. And Basically, for the next five years, I barely got a day off. I got paid absolutely. I think my first, my starting wage was eight thousand pounds a year, which I couldn't live on. Um, my mum and dad had to help me out massively. Um, I lived in uh, I lived in a rented room in uh, in a house in in Leeds, but I was having the best time. I went all over the world. Even then, I went all over the world. Uh, I was photographing football teams that went anywhere. I did Champions Leagues. I I did um, Lions Tours. Uh, I did Commonwealth Games. And it was incredible. Uh, so I'm just going to flick through now. So these, these are just a few of the kind of uh, things that I was doing at the time. These were assignments that newspapers were sending me on. I had to turn up to an event, to a football match, uh, and essentially be every other photographer that was there this was the competition i would go in and all i knew is that, that day i had to get the best picture i had to get the best angle i had to get the best celebration and if i didn't we basically didn't eat it wasn't that it we did eat but it was if i didn't get my picture published in the newspaper the next day that was it we got no money but if i turned up and i got five pictures in the newspaper the next day like with that uh Darren Goff celebration in a test match against uh, uh, Australia to win the game all over all the newspapers we were laughing so it was great it was it was just it was a huge competition uh, and I took it really seriously uh, I took it I, I really raised my um, levels of everything I just wanted to be better than anybody else I wanted to get better pictures than everybody else so I was always looking for for a little step a little angle to try and uh, appeal to newspapers that were looking to publish these pictures eventually that ran out on this day so peter crouch scores his first hat trick for uh liverpool against arsenal in front of the cop end he stands in front of me i was doing a project for the, the premier league at this point and um i had a wide angle lens on i wouldn't normally have had a wide angle lens on here so he stood in front of me and i remember there were 50 photographers around me who all turned around to me and were like, oh, I cannot believe the look of you because I had this wide angle picture on. There's Anfield in the background looking amazing. And this was a kind of pivotal, pivotal moment in my career. This was when newspapers stopped using independent small freelance agencies. Uh, they used, they turned to using big agencies like Getty Images and the press association who they had deals with and stopped using our pictures. So basically our uh, our income stream was stopped. This was as newspapers declined and the internet rose. So that was, a, that was the first fundamental shift in my career when something changed. So the reason that this was significant was that this was the best picture taken that day, I guarantee it, 100%. And I got it in two, two newspapers the next day. And I remember having a meeting with my then boss on the Monday and we were like, we've got to change because this is, we're not getting pictures in newspapers anymore because they're not using independent 
agencies. So um, at the time midweek when I wasn't uh, shooting sport, live sport at the weekends, I was doing portraits. Basically, newspaper desks in London, they just assumed that anywhere, if you lived in Leeds, anywhere was within 20 minutes. They'd be like, oh, can you pop to Hull? Uh, we've got a job in 20 minutes. We'd be like, yeah, fine, sure. Oh, we've got a job in Manchester. Are you able to make it in 10? We'd be like, yeah, 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 no problem. So we went everywhere. These new places. I basically was um, on a daily basis taking portraits of some of the most amazing uh, sportsmen that the UK had to offer north of Watford. Uh, this guy, interestingly, was one of my heroes. He's the captain of captain of Leeds United. Uh, his name was Lucas Radivi. And during this interview, he lifted up his shirt to show us where he'd been shot in a township in South Africa. The bullet went in here and came out at his back. So from that moment on, I was like, this guy is a hero. Uh, he also, we also, he was so down to earth. Me and him had the same car. We used to turn up in the Leeds United um, uh, car park and Jimmy Floyd, Hasselbank and all these amazing footballers would have their Ferraris uh, and Lamborghinis. And me and him had the same awful red Mondeo because he sent all of his money back to his uh, his family in South Africa. So I, I, I really stuck with me. I had a lot of respect for this guy. Anyway, moving on. Um, so I, I got the opportunity to photograph uh, these sports people, some funny uh some not um, for newspapers. Um, and then came the second pivotal thing for me. So this this happened, and this this is what kind of shaped my opportunities, uh, my opportunities going forward. I've always been, I've always thought that I've been very lucky. I've been lucky in my career that the right things happened at the right time. And I've always kind of, more often, more recently, kind of look back at that look and gone, well, you know, how much of that was luck and how much of that did I, did I make? At the time, I was working really hard and I was working really hard to, it was, this was all a competition for me. My wage wasn't any different. So the competition for me was to get pictures in newspapers. The more pictures in newspapers and magazines I got, the better a photographer I appeared to be to all the people I was working against. So... Uh, every opportunity I could get to to like, get my name out there, this is why my ego is out of control. Every opportunity I could get, I took. Um, this job here was for the Times. So the Times newspaper uh, were interviewing Wayne at a hotel in Manchester, and they asked me to go along to do a portrait of Wayne uh, to go along with the article. It was great. Um, this was called is what's called an appearance. So basically, Wayne is employed by EA Sports. He's, he's there. This is ten years ago. This is um, FIFA 10. He was employed to promote FIFA 10. Um, he would they would give journalists access to Wayne for 10, 15 minutes in return for them using a branded picture in the newspaper. That's how this works, right? Um, so I went along, did these pictures. Uh, they they got into the newspaper and a few days later EA got in touch with me and they were like we love the stuff that you did for Wayne would you mind coming and doing the same for some of our other assets some of the other sports people that they uh, they sponsor and some more stuff with Wayne I was like yeah yeah sure so within two weeks I was on a private jet with Wayne Rooney so I secretly took this picture. This has never been made public, so I hope I don't get in trouble for this. But basically, I'm on a private jet. That's Wayne Rooney. That was his agent, Paul Stretford, sat in front of us with the uh, with the two phones in his hand. That's his bodyguard behind on the phone, and that is the front of the aeroplane just there. So I learned a few things these days. We were going to Barcelona to, I was basically just shooting some behind the scenes content of him shooting a new um, uh, advert for FIFA and there was a spare seat on the plane, so I got to go. Uh, uh, I'm like, I'm living the dream at this point. Um, many things happened that day, uh, but here are the things that I learned about private jets. 
they are not like Air Force One. I thought I was going to get up, get on there, we'd be able to have a wander around, sit in the lounge. It is not. It's tiny. It is uh, not that I'm, you know, saying <laughs> I wasn't grateful for being on a private jet, but it was super uncomfortable. Uh, the toilet also contained a fridge full of champagne and platters after platter upon platter of sushi. It was a very odd space to be in. Uh, also, when you hit um, uh, turbulence in a private jet, it is terrifying. The plane at one point dropped hundreds and hundreds of feet and the bodyguard wasn't strapped in. So he flew and hit the ceiling. I'm pretty sure he knocked himself out. Um, we all screamed. I mean, it was really terrifying. Uh, we got through that. I'm pretty sure the pilots were laughing at us. We got through that. We landed. And this was the best bit for me, was that within a minute and a half of landing at an airport, we were in our cars and driving away. I mean, how is that even possible? The rich just live in this incredible world of, yeah, I mean, I, we could have taken anything. It was, it was crazy. So I got to spend the day with uh, with Wayne on the flight and we, we had a little chat. We talked about cars, uh, who who was buying what, you know, at, uh, at the club. So it was, all of a sudden I'm just like, I'd, I'd take a little step back and go, this is, this is nuts. I, I still can't quite believe I'm sat here. Uh, this was another job that came about from that same job, pre his hair job uh, for Nike. So I got uh, got a little bit of work for Nike as well. And it all kind of added to bolster my reputation within their, uh, their circles and magazines. And all of a sudden you get a few more calls to do different jobs and different briefs. So then I started shooting EA's other talents. So Xavi Alonso, this is just in the back streets of Liverpool, uh, Rory, uh, I had an amazing day with him at, at the uh, Ryder Cup course in Wales. All of these things, all of these people, every time I turn up, it's a different brief, a different task. This was a good one. Adebayor, we photographed him at the Grove Hotel in um, uh, Surrey. Uh, and we just cleaned up. You know, newspapers don't have to use those pictures. They can be really difficult. Newspapers have, you know, if you try and force them to do something, they won't do it. So. Basically, I, I, I was having to balance um, getting the branding and making the picture aesthetic and interesting enough that a newspaper would want to use it and also accept the fact that it had, a, it had branding. That was my niche. And all of a sudden, this is where I was like, hmm, hold on. I, I, can, I can make something happen here. Um, and it kind of culminated in, in this shoot, which was really interesting. Whilst this doesn't have the, the branding, this was EA Sports. Um, he had a contract whereby EA weren't allowed to brand any of his clothes, hence it was just a pure night top. But this would then go on, a, on a, uh, an EA branded magazine cover. Um, so what I basically um, been teaching myself over the years and it was just me there was nobody else showing me how to do this it was just trial and error and getting abused by a few footballers a few times taught me valuable lessons like be quick and, and don't mess around and don't take too many shots and a lot of the stuff that I was doing these the the people weren't getting paid for they were, they were having to do it out of the goodness of their own self publicity and heart. Um, so I, I became very efficient at being very, very creative very quickly. Um, when I turned up to this shoot, we were in um, we were in a driving range in the Hudson in New York, and uh, I was working for EA. Um, it was an EA appearance, but there were hundreds and hundreds of media there. Um, at this point, Tiger Woods was the second most famous person on the planet. He was the second most recognized person after Michael Jackson. 
So it was a big deal. And this was a huge job. Uh, the night before I'd, we'd uh, landed in um, New York and we'd been out for, we'd been out for dinner. I'd been incredibly nervous. Uh, British Airways had lost one of my bags with my kit in. Um, uh, was utterly terrified. But the restaurant that we were, walked into, um, Jeff Goldblum was standing at the bar. So this is my first time in New York. I walk into a bar and Jeff Goldblum's standing there. I'm like, well, this is it. I've, I, it doesn't get any better. Sounds like the start of a really good joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, so to be fair, what I did was I, he, he, he left and I ran outside. I'm like, I can't, I cannot be here and not ask for a picture. So part of, one of the written rules is in, in our job, you don't ask for selfies. I don't ask for selfies with famous people. It's just not cool. It's just not done. And we get told a lot of the time that we're not allowed to anyway. So I'm in a restaurant. Nobody's telling me not to. So I run outside. I'm like, Jeff, any chance I could take? Can I, uh, can I um, get a picture with you? And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Take three. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. <laughs> so I take, I take three pictures of Jeff Goldblum. He's like, right, let's have a look. So he, li he edited my pictures. He went through, he went, no, delete that one. Uh, no, don't like that one. Delete that one. We'll keep that one. I was like, oh, thanks, Jeff. I, uh, this is where I chose it. I was like, Jeff, um, do you, uh, we're just, we're just having a drink. Do you fancy joining us? And there was a split second where he looked at me and he was like, mm, no, uh, <laughs> I'm on a, I'm in a show on Broadway, but thanks. Would have been really nice. I was like, ah, oh, there was a split second where he nearly, he nearly joined us for a drink. <laughs> anyway, so I'm like, right, well, this is a sign. This is going to be the best, best shoot ever. And then oh, I just kind of went back and at dinner, we were like, this is the night before we shot Tiger. And I was like, should we, hold, should we make him hold a golf ball up to his eye? And everybody around the table was like, yeah, no, I haven't seen that before. Has anybody seen that? No, no, we were Googling it. Well, pre-Google, but we, we were trying to find it on the internet. Couldn't find it. Um, and my client uh, was just like, we should really hang a star and stripe, stripes up behind him as well. I was like, yes. So we bought that flag the next morning we, t we were turning up with no comprehension or idea of what we did. And then I walked away that afternoon. Oh, firstly, I'm waiting to photograph Tiger and a, a lady walks in and goes, um, oh, Tiger will be with you in a minute. You've got three minutes and 15 seconds with him. I was like, what? She's like, oh. three minutes, three minutes and 10 seconds. I was like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> and literally to the second, uh, Tiger was, was, that was exactly how long he was put in front of me and wheeled away. And I walked away with that picture, which is probably still, no, it's not the best picture I've ever taken, but just in terms of the story and the emotional attachment behind it, my favorite. Um, and then I got to photograph Roger. So this is my other bit of the watershed moment. And Sorry, guys, if, if I'm kind of droning on and I just hope you take the little bits that I'm trying to, to get through around these stories. The point of this bit is when this is where the business part of my job changed. So I'm tasked with going to uh, Zurich to photograph Roger. There's a very interesting story about this, but you'll have to ask me about this if we ever meet up in a pub because it's not one for a... Uh, 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 for our webinar, but do ask me, it's, it's hilarious. Um, so I go to Zurich to photograph Roger for Gillette. Now, there's a famous video of Roger hitting a tennis ball. He's in a studio and he hits a tennis ball off a guy's head. So he's he's got a bottle on his head with a tennis ball on top. No, he's got a bottle on his head and he hits a ten he serves the tennis ball and knocks the ball off. Well, if you look in the back of that video, I'm there. This was part of the whole this was part of the whole job. Within it was one of the first kind of viral video successes. Within two days it got eight million views on YouTube, which at the time was insane. Um, the reason that this was an interesting uh business job for me was I was also asked to produce something that was called that was above the line. So I was asked to create 
this. Um, so this was a an advert which Gillette were going to use for an agency called BBDO. Uh, and because I was there, they were like, we can't get the time. We haven't got the time for another photographer to like a proper photographer to come in and do this. So you're just going to have to do it. And I'm like, oh, thanks. Um, but I then discovered how much money they paid for above the line advertising photographer. And I'm like, what? I did not know this. I <laughs> hold on. How much? Um, <laughs> It was a kind of, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a ridiculous amount of money, but it was, it was a significant shift for me to kind of go, ah, right. So this is, <laughs> this is, this is another part of the industry that I didn't know. Um, normally when people uh, get into this part of the industry, they've done the traditional route where they assist for a big commercial photographer and then they go into that i've come from this uh newspaper world which was notoriously underpaid and uh uh and undervalued and i've drifted into this commercial world and i'm like ah oh, hold on so there's the end of the rainbow and I, now i'm getting super competitive and i'm like right okay i know that uh i just uh, I've gone. I've gone about this the wrong way. Uh, I know that this is out there. I know that these kind of jobs are there. How, how do I do this? So my uh, my response was basically just to milk every opportunity that I could. And Gareth was a good uh, was a good example of this. So Gareth Bale, uh, one time the world's most expensive footballer, currently at Real Madrid, still worth hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds. Uh, this guy I photographed here where he was pre, uh, pre mega famous, but he was clearly a talent when he was at Spurs. So this is me and Gareth Bale on our own at the um, police football training center, just I think 10 miles from the Tottenham training ground. In, I can't remember where it was. But it's like a police football pitch. Um, and he's like me, I turned up and he turned up in his, his massive Audi R8 and we just hung out and did some pictures. No agent, no fanfare, no nothing. Um, this probably my second most favorite photograph um, in terms of emotional attachment, mainly because it was the first time I'd ever taken like a really beautiful picture of a footballer that wasn't a cliche kind of man kicks ball, man sprints, man, you know, makes tackle. It was like, oh, we're trying to do a proper portrait of a very talented person in a very aesthetic way. And actually, it went from me taking this picture to ending up on the front of the Telegraph magazine. And it was hugely lauded within Adidas and as a, as a kind of new way to represent those boots. Cause this is all about those boots. This is about nothing else. This is about those boots for the next boots that were coming out. So how can we get it out there? I'm not sure the Telegraph magazine was the, uh, <laughs> was the exact audience that would be buying a pair of F 50s. But for me, it was a huge success. Side note, Gareth only would only let us use this picture if we retouched his feet. He hated them. Uh, we, I had to spend 10 minutes persuading him to not have this picture with his socks on. And it would have ruined it. If he'd have had socks on in this picture, it would have been, it, just, it would have been terrible. But there's something about his, his naked feet on the floor that just kind of ground it and make it beautiful. Anyway, so I then, when, uh, I, I then developed my relationship with, uh, with Gareth and his team. I ended up, this is, this is a shot from, I spent two days, two days at Gareth's house in, in Madrid, um, uh, basically doing stuff for his own team, for his own website, um, uh, and his own brand to try and push his global fashion, uh, appeal. They wanted to create this folio of images so they could go to Hugo Boss or Armani and say, look how great Gareth looks, blah, blah, blah. So 
I was tasked with just hanging out with him for two days and just taking these amazing pictures at his house. Again, another moment where I have to step back and go, this is, this is nuts, especially when we were on top of his house. He lived in a, he lived in a, um, a private res not reserve, a private, private estate. Uh, and we were stood on top of his house and he said, do you see that house over there? And it, it basically looked like a pirate ship. I was like, yeah. He said, that's Ronaldo's house. So over the the other side of the lake was Ronaldo's house. And he went, oh, listen to this. And as we, we just kind of looked over the edge of his balcony, this car, a Bugatti Veyron, which was at the time the most expensive car in the world, went past doing about 150 miles an hour. And uh, it was Kareem Benzema, his other like oh. insanely expensive teammate. So I'm like, God, this is, this is nuts. Not as nuts as walking into his um, house on the first day and uh, and he said, "What would you like some lunch?" I was like, "Oh, yeah, sure. What have you got?" He went, "Well, the chef will make you anything you want." And I was like, "What? <laughs> what? A chef? You joking me?" Yeah, and Chef Paul made me a beautiful omelet. I mean, it never got better than that, really. Anyway, so I got to know Gareth really well. Super lovely guy, really down to earth, like great family around him great friends like really nice also a great golfer and we worked together for years and these commercial opportunities popped up this this was a good this is probably the highlight i've always tried to work out exactly how much if you wanted to buy all of those players there sorry if you're not a football fan guys but if you were to buy uh those five players there it, i mean i it the, i reckon now it, it or at their peak, each one, that would have been like a billion. And that's not even an exaggeration either. That's like actual no. numbers. Like yeah, the, 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 I think that'd be a it's disgusting fact. amounts. <laughs> yeah. So that was, yeah. So thankfully nothing exploded or went wrong that day because that would have been super embarrassing. So, uh, so I got to do all these fantastic things with Dick and it led to, this is the point, it led to this commercial work. So I followed this, I, I kind of, it was like a, I was like a bloodhound trying to sniff out these, opportunities where uh, brands would spend, would have big budgets to do adverts and really outlandish things. Um, trying to step a little bit away from sport because sport becomes uh, a little bit, um, it's very short term, those boots, the kits, everything changes really quickly. So from a commercial perspective, it's high turnover, it's fast, it's not, there's no longevity, not like you would get from a, a campaign shooting for L'Oreal, which might, might last five years, or Chanel, which would last huge amounts of time. Uh, and the, the rights extensions from the photography for that would basically pay for a, your holiday home in the south of France, if you were so inclined. Um, so sport, uh, sport, sport, was, sport was difficult. Um, so I got to this point here and I thought it would be just interesting to go back. Sorry, that was Snoop Dogg. Um, that was, that was, that Gareth was supposed to be there that day. That was why I got this in and he wasn't, he missed out on missing Snoop Dogg, which was hilarious. Uh, anyway, so the, so the skill sets, the, this, I think, translates massively into any job in the creative industry 100 percent, especially photography and film directions in, in the type like getting to places has been the biggest part of my job like the, globally locally not having the right information to be able to do your job kills you the organization of kit is so ridiculously important. These are just stupid things that I've had to learn the really, really hard way over the years. Organization, I've turned up on three shoots over my entire life where I haven't had a power lead to my laptop. That is a disaster. <clears throat> Let me tell you, it is as good as forgetting your camera. Um, so really nailing those things down and timing. I am never ever ever late i can't be 
I have to be, I will be hours early to make sure I'm not late. I will never be late on set. I will never keep anybody waiting because in my industry, where nobody ever tells you why you never get employed again, every single impression you can make lasts. If you're trying your hardest to make the right impression, if you don't, then fine. But if it's down to laziness and it's down to your lack of preparation, that somebody makes a judgment and then decides never to employ you again because they don't have to tell you why, then you're, you're kind of letting yourself down. And I was determined to never let myself down. And finally, the imagination to deal with situations that don't go your way. So this is a good example. You might recognize this guy. This is Lionel Messi. Uh, I had to go to Barcelona to photograph him for those boots. This was one of the final creatives. Another one of the pictures that we did. This is me teaching the world's best footballer how to play football. As you can see from his face there, he was not interested in me teaching him anything. Um, I'm super embarrassed by this picture, by the way, but I thought it was good to show that I can uh, be embarrassed publicly about it. <laughs> um, I turned up on this job. Uh, I can't, I don't want to badmouth Lionel, but he was not in a great mood that day. Um, he basically, due to his actions, um, I was supposed to have three hours to set up. I was given five minutes. In that five minutes, I had to set up three hours worth of uh, lighting and prep to shoot him for the cover of 442 magazine. I had to shoot him in a specific way. He did none of those things. <laughs> Lionel was uh, making his own rules up that, that day, and it was really difficult. We had a second set that we couldn't go to, uh, which was where this sh picture should have been taken, but thanks to my clever retoucher, he's actually added Lionel's head in there. Um, that is Lionel's body double in the middle. And that picture there was taken the day before Lionel turned up. It was so bad that we actually had to use um, somebody else's body for that image because uh, everything that we planned just went out the window. But we had to be very, very quick and very, very creative about how we solved that, <laughs> which, which we did. It wasn't ideal, but we had, we had to walk away with a set of pictures that the client and everybody was happy with. This wasn't the final, by the way, it didn't look like this, the, the, the cover of 442, all those, the goal was gone and all the nets were gone and it was retouched, but we at least managed to get a face and a body that, that um, were put together. And again, if we ever meet in person, ask me to tell you about this and I'll, I'll give you the other version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where I where I cry, where I, I at one point I nearly cried. I was lying on the floor and I lich I put my head down, and and I felt somebody rubbing the back of my head. And I looked up and Lionel was just rubbing the back of my head, and he gave me a little little wink and I walked off. And I was like, oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, he did get a uh, puncture and couldn't leave for three hours after that. How ironic! That's so ironic. Yeah, terrible. Um, so. Um, go on. Sorry, I'm just gonna have to say um, we're running really tight on time. Um, I was How just wondering we if we've got it? um, we've got about five or six minutes to do some Q and A. Um, oh my god, I'm really happy. Yeah, time. I haven't got <laughs> just just a little bit, just a little bit. Is there so okay. just before? Is is there anything that you know that was left to say that you really wanted to stress before we move on to some questions? Yeah. Yeah. What well, I'm going to do is just flick to where I am now. So uh, the one crucial bit that I haven't got to everybody is we are now all creators. Uh, whatever we do, I don't think there's any photographers, any any filmmakers. Now we are creators. I don't. I'm not. I wasn't a fan of that word, but I am now. I think we all go into this world uh, on an even playing field. Anybody out there listening to me now, you could be competing against me tomorrow. 
you could be, if you went out there and took a better picture than I did of a better person than I did, and Adidas wanted to use it on their channels, they'd use it on their channels. They wouldn't look at your qualifications and go, oh, well, he hasn't, got a, uh, he hasn't got this or he hasn't got that. What they would say is that guy knows what he's doing. He's done it incredibly well. Uh, and we're, we're going to employ him. We're going to use him. What I've got is experience and I've got a network. And that is more important to me than my photographic knowledge. I would suggest if you're doing anything in the creative industries, know your kit inside out. 100% so you can react very quickly to any given situation and be as creative as your mind will let you uh, let you be. Otherwise, get out there uh, and uh, and create, and you know, opportunities will fly at you. Oh, sorry, Joe. Ben, that was a quicker that's all right. wind up than I expected. <laughs> but. Yeah, I'm so sorry. We're, we've been um, a little bit tight for time. I could ju- I could sit here and listen to you all day. I'm These stories that you've I'm got. Just, I'm just ranting honestly <laughs> no honestly it's so interesting and all of these pictures that we're looking at now you know they're they're huge stories in their own right you know they're all massive experiences that you've had and i think that's one thing to take away from it yeah. to anyone who's watching is that if you do go into the world like this that when you do have this huge portfolio and i can see you've got pictures on the wall behind you i'm guessing you know there'll have been shots that you've done and i imagine your house is probably the sort of house where you walk around you've got pictures on the wall and there's a huge story behind every single one And that, I think, is something that a lot of photographers look forward to having. Look forward to having. Yeah, 100%. Um, To me, it's it's all about that emotional attachment. Go on, sorry, Jess, go Sorry, (laughs) no, you're right. It is the emotional attachment. You're absolutely right. Um, Right, let's just take some questions from um, some of our uh, guests who are watching. Um, First one, what is your top tip when it comes to framing a shot? I'd imagine that sports photography is quite difficult to plan because it's so in the moment. Well, it's it is and it isn't. You, I used to turn up to football matches going, if I can get this shot, I'll be really happy, and then I'd look for it. Uh, I would I would know that um, an ideal shot for me it would be uh, background complete out of focus, long lens, uh, two people eyes open, good expressions good moment of action uh, that looks alive and dynamic and nothing's awkward and do you know what I, I got I got used to looking at so many pictures I, I'd instantly I'd be so quick at, at, at flicking through I'll be like that's the one that's the one that's the one because there was a little aesthetic there was an aesthetic about everything it's like great music and it's like great art you just you look at something and there is nothing that jars there's an aesthetic position and composition uh, and nothing out of place. That, that's what I'd be looking for. Um, what type of editing software are you using? Is it Lightroom, Photoshop? Are you, you know, is it Adobe the way to go or is there something else that you'd recommend? Uh, Adobe, for my raw processing, I use something called Capture One, which is if you were to turn up at, uh, for a big commercial shoot, uh, and I've done big shoots where there've been four or five of the world's best sport photographers there working in different areas, and every single one of them will be using Capture One, which is the industry standard uh, studio tethered um, raw software. But I also use uh, Photoshop. I use Camera Raw in Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom. I know a lot of people use Lightroom. It's very popular with the kind of modern creators and influencers these days, but it's not. It it's not for me. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you could give to someone, you know, let's say twenty one and under, who's wanting to go into the same career as you? So I've worked this out, right? The the kids that I've seen come through and the ones that are now really, really smashing it are ferocious at creating all the time, personal projects. They find people they wanna work with. They find other talented people that do the same thing that they can or can complement what they do. If they're a photographer, they might find a graphic artist to work on projects together. Like your social presence is super important. I, I have 
I try to work out how to not care so much about uh, Instagram. It's it's a, it's a really emotional platform, especially when you're following other photographers and other people doing other things. You've got to you've got to work out where you are and where your head's at. But once you do, and once you shut out all the noise and you concentrate on creating, honestly, it all comes after that. The other the other piece of advice, if you're going to be a photographer now, 100% get your head around Photoshop uh, and your own retouching because the marketplace now is crowded with so many amazing photographers that can also retouch their images that if you can't, I, mean, I think you you really put yourself at a disadvantage. Um, what are you shooting on? What we're we talking Hasselblad, Canon, Nikon. So I've used every camera. Uh, I've used um, every brand apart from Sony. I know Sony's hugely popular these days. I shoot on Nikon uh, D850s. I've got two of those and a uh, Leica Q2, which is my kind of um, social round the neck uh, camera. And if I go into the studio, I used to use this thing called a phase one, but now um, Fuji have just released this 100 megapixel studio camera, which I used on the Manchester United kit shoot, and it was unbelievable. So that's for the camera geeks out there. The, the Fuji 100 megapixel uh, studio camera is amazing. Um, what GCSEs um, would someone need to become a photographer or maybe not so much GCSEs, but if we're talking uh, early on education qualifications, what sort of creative route would you suggest people take? Is it sort of going the arts way, you know? I, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, you know, I did, I did art at GCSE and the A-level. I did an art foundation, um, all of which helped my uh understanding of the frame which i do think is key i also think that you know there will be a few people out there that will do a different nine gcses and still be as good a photographer as i could ever be um so it's I, it's one of those ones isn't it it's not written in, these things aren't written in stone this this job this is why it's so um I don't want to use the word flaky, but trying to get into this industry, the the people I know that are coming through the ranks are in touch with social and the world and trend and fashion. They're also clever people. They've also done their GCSEs. Um, I don't, I'm not sure it matters. I don't know if this is the right message to say, but I, I'm not sure if it matters what those, those, GCSEs are, I just know that they're incredibly driven, uh, incredibly good at, uh, at getting their own message out there and driving themselves forward to constantly create. Do you remember your first shot? Do you remember your first professionally paid shot and, uh, and what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, after I won the Daily Telegraph uh, Young Photographer of the Year competition, the agency that I was joining sent me to a uh, a football club in Birmingham to do a feature for the, it was called the Independent Newspaper, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was a big broadsheet newspaper. With, they used to love pictures, so they did amazing pictures. And they sent me to do a behind the scenes, like documentary job on this really lower league team that got into the quarterfinals of the FA Cup or a later round of the FA Cup. Um, and I had to send, I uh, shot it all on film and I had to send them up to the, the agency. This is, this is a week before I'd actually joined. Um, but because I lived near there, they just, they, they sent me off to do this job. And, uh, I remember about, about 10 years later, there was another photographer there at the time who we were out having dinner and she said to me, she was like, that job that you sent back, I was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. Yeah. yeah. She's like, it was so bad, they nearly <laughs> considered firing you before you'd even started. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> it, yeah, I did a terrible job. So that that was my first professional uh, paid picture. And uh, one final one final question, if you could just uh, just 
sum it up briefly what is the most rewarding part of being a photographer for you possibly besides the money um so i i just briefed uh, i'm gonna answer that in two parts very very quickly first part money um I don't want you to think that I'm a, uh, a multimillionaire. I'm still chasing those jobs. I still haven't worked <laughs> it out. I still, I, I, because I've come up the other route, I, I still, I know it's out there. I know those jobs are out there. I know those big, big commercial jobs are there. I'm still trying to work out how to get them. So this is ongoing for me, very much ongoing. Um, the, the best part for me is, is the memories um you know looking back the thing i'm so lucky i'm so privileged to have been in so many situations that i couldn't have paid to have been in uh you know i i don't i can't put it into words there was one day the most ridiculous moment was i was in a in a, i was in a ballroom in in Los Angeles on a really, it was a badge. It was a, I was working for a, a magazine, taking photographs at a conference, a TV conference. It was a tough, it was a tough job. But at one point I was stood, my client walked me over to two people and said, just wait here, Ben. I'm just gonna go and get the third person to have your photograph uh, for you to take their picture. I was left stood talking to Judge Judy and Donald Trump. So the, the three of us, we're just looking at each other going, oh, hi. Uh, so what do we talk about? Brilliant. Thankfully, Judge Judy and Donald had stuff to talk about. So I just basically stood there looking at Donald's <laughs> hair. This was a long time ago, people, before I could have stopped, uh, uh, you know, the presidential thing. <laughs> and it, it's things like that every time I kind of look back and I'm like, wow, you know. But at the same time, it's terrifying. If uh, this job is constantly changing, this industry is constantly changing, I've had to change. There was a bit that I was gonna tell you all about, about me having to be more relevant and shoot like, uh, shoot more analog. So I've gone from shooting film at the start of my career, it's now digital. Now the cool thing to do is shoot film again. So I'm kind of turning up going, ah, oh, I've done that. But actually, I've quite, I've quite enjoyed it. So, uh yeah. Yeah, and um, just really, really quickly, one final one. We just have one more come in. Um, what's uh, the one piece of advice you could give to uh, a young person when choosing their career path? Uh, I mean, I don't want to sound like a cliche, but give it everything. Everything. Don't slow down. Don't. And the people that you meet are so important my career would be nothing without the friends that i've made nothing brilliant absolutely fabulous ben you've been so great to speak to you today i could honestly sit and chat with you for hours i'm sure everyone who's watching would like me to um i just want to say as well your website ben duffy photography.com um everyone should get over there and actually have a look because the pictures that we didn't get a chance to talk about today they're all on the website um, as well. So um, Sorry. honestly, go. That's all right. don't apologize, don't apologize. It's been absolutely fantastic to speak to you. Um, some great questions from everyone that's uh, come through as well. Just a quick reminder uh, here at Learn Lounge, uh, we're helping to raise awareness for the Children's Trust. You can donate via the link that's on screen now. Uh, make sure you tune in next week on Monday afternoon where we'll be joined by BBC News presenter Martine Croxall. I'm very excited for that one. And uh, she'll be sharing some interesting anecdotes from her career as a news anchor and reporter. Ben, thank you so much for being here today. We really, really Pleasure. appreciate it. You've been absolutely fantastic. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.